Every human being is afraid of something. Now granted, some people manage their fears better than others, but every person is afraid of at least one thing. For instance, some, some people suffer from arachibutryophobia. I had to look at how it's supposed to be pronounced. Arachibutryophobia. Now, what is this? Well, I don't want to put a new fear in your head, but arachibutryophobia, or however you pronounce that word, is the fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. Believe it or not, this is acknowledged by the American Academy of Psychiatric Medicine as a legitimate psychological condition, which probably proves that the American Academy of Psychiatric Medicine really isn't legitimate. But in any case, maybe a dollop of peanut butter doesn't freak you out. Then perhaps you suffer from acrophobia, the fear of heights. Or agoraphobia, the fear of the outdoors. Or claustrophobia, the fear of being in enclosed spaces. Makes me wonder what someone who, who lives in the mountains and suffers from agoraphobia and claustrophobia at the same time, what do they do? I mean, wouldn't that be terrible? First of all, you're living real high. That's not good. You can't stay inside because that makes you feel like you're claustrophobic. You can't go outside because you're afraid of outside. I mean, it would be terrible. They would be, in, they would be just in a terrible shape. Of course, there are other fears that disturb people, such as pedophobia, which is the fear of dolls. You're right, baby dolls. And i got to admit, those, if you've ever seen those real-life baby dolls, they kind of freak me out. I know that. Or maybe, you're a, or maybe you suffer from ergophobia, which is the fear of work. Or optophobia, the fear of opening your eyes. Okay, let's, let's take a poll here. How many have, of you have an attack of ergophobia and optophobia when the alarm clock rings on Monday mornings. Okay. Then again, verbophobia might be your problem. Verbophobia is the fear of words. Can you imagine going to a counselor and you suffer from verbophobia? When they ask, what's wrong? You'd be going... Of course, it's entirely possible that you're like good old Charlie Brown, who told Lucy, that's it, when she asked him if he suffered from pantophobia. Pantophobia is the fear of everything. But you know, if I had to make a guess, I would say that the greatest fear of all is tanithophobia. Tanithophobia is the fear of death. Perhaps you have a fear of death. Now, you're sure that Jesus is your Savior. There's no doubt in your heart and mind that that's true. But you still have this deep-seated fear of death. The fact that you're going to die someday is a very uncomfortable thought to you. You don't want to think about it. You don't want to talk about it. And you probably don't want to hear a sermon about it. But I want you to listen to what the Bible says. Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people, because all sinned. And then in Hebrew 9, 27, the Bible says, just as people are destined to die once, and after that, to face judgment. Look, there's only one way to escape the inevitability of death. And that is, Jesus has to come first before you die. If that happens, you will never experience physical death. But the odds are, most of us, if not all of us, sitting in this sanctuary this morning and watching online, will will die physically before Jesus comes again. That's why it's so important for every Christian to come to grips with their fear of death. And that brings me to this morning's message.
What we're going to do is we're going to take some of the most common concerns that people have about death, and we're going to see exactly what the Bible has to say about these things. Now, before we begin, let's, let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask you now to be with us as we go through this message this morning. Father, perhaps there are some who, who, who have that fear of death that lingers in their heart and mind even today. And Father, I pray that you'll be with them. And I pray, Father, that for all of us, this will be a message of hope and encouragement. And we ask these favors in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I know that we don't get to, to decide things like this, but um, here's how I would like to die, okay? I'd like to be in excellent health somewhere in my late 80s, or early 90s. I'd like to be on vacation, preferably somewhere where the, there's salt in the air and soft tropical breezes to keep me cool. I'd like to be with my family, and I hope that we have spent a happy day together. Then I'd want to kiss everyone goodnight, lay down beside Pam, and die in the middle of the night. Now, I know that that would be tough on my family when they discovered that I had died, but they should know that I will have died a happy person. Now, I'm going to guess that most people, if they had their choice, would probably opt for a death similar to this. But the truth is, relatively few people have that chance. For many people, dying is a long and difficult process. It may be as the result of a pandemic like COVID. It may be because of a, of a respiratory disease like uh, COPD. It may be a cardiovascular disease like a, an enlarged heart or hardened arteries, arterial sclerosis. It may be a devastating battle with cancer. Or it may be the long goodbye of Alzheimer's and dementia. I could keep going on and on talking about the different ways that painfully take people's lives. But this is the kind of thing most people are afraid of when they say, I'm afraid of what might happen before I die. And it's perfectly normal to have that sense of, of, of dread and uncertainty in your life. Most people do not want to think about enduring a prolonged period of intense pain and mental anguish. Most people don't want to imagine the possibility that they will become a burden to their family. And almost no one wants to imagine a life where they have completely lost control of their bodies and they're totally dependent on someone for even caring for basic bodily functions. But what happens if you have to endure some sort of terrible disease? some illness, some prolonged illness before you die. Well, the Bible makes two important promises that have provided hope and encouragement for, for Christians throughout the centuries. God's Word assures you that one, God will never fail or forsake you. And two, God's grace will always be sufficient for you. Now, let's begin with that first promise. The Lord will never fail or forsake you. Now, this promise is found in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. Here it says, The Lord Himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Now, the key words here in this verse are leave and forsake. Now, the Hebrew words essentially mean the same thing. It means to abandon someone in the desert, which would be to say, I'm leaving you to die. So the idea is that God is never going to leave your side. No matter what happens, He is always going to be with you. No one knows exactly who wrote the classic poem, Footprints in the Sand, but it speaks to God's promise to never leave or forsake you. I know you can't read the words on the screen, so I'll just I'll read them for you. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was one, only one set of footprints. 
This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life when I was suffering from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could see only one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always. But I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, you've not been there for me. The Lord replied, the times when you have seen only one set of footprints is when I carried you. Now, the second promise here is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Take your Bibles and turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Listen to what God's word says here. Because of these surpassingly great revelations, Paul had seen a vision of the highest heaven. Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But He said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for My power is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about My weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on Me. How many of you have been boasting in your weaknesses lately? Most of us like to focus on the good things that are going on. Paul says, I'm focusing on the, ter- the t- difficult things that I'm experiencing. Now, we don't know what this thorn in the flesh that Paul had was. The weight of evidence suggests that it was some sort of deliber- debilitating physical ailment. In any event, it was so bad that three times Paul pleaded with God, take this away from me. But God refused to bring about the healing that Paul was asking for. But he did make him a promise. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. This means God's power and grace will always provide you, always provide you with the strength and the endurance to bear up under any circumstances you might face. The very fact that Paul was able to write these words prove that God keeps His promises. When Rusty Warmer was executed by the state of South Carolina for a drug-fueled rampage of murder, his best friend Bob McAllister was by his side. It was a very unlikely friendship. Rusty was a high school graduate who went, a high school dropout who wound up on death row. Bob was a lawyer and the chief of staff to South Carolina's governor. Bob had met Rusty through his ministry to men on death row in South Carolina's central prison. It took Bob a while to break through Rusty's hostility and resentment. But eventually, Bob helped lead Rusty Wormer to a faith, saving faith in Jesus Christ. As the day of his execution drew near, Bob was visiting Rusty in his jail cell. And he asked him, Rusty, are you scared? What will your thoughts be when they strap you in the electric chair? Rusty Wormer thought about it for a minute, and then he said, well, the human side of me is scared to be electrocuted. They tell me I won't feel nothing, but I've stuck my finger in a light socket before, and it hurt plenty. So even if it hurts for one millionth of a second, that's scary. But I know I'm going to be holding Jesus' hand. I know He's going to be with me. As long as He's with me, I'll be okay. No one can know exactly what you're going to face in life. I know that if there were a medical test that could tell me today exactly what I would be facing over the next 15 to 20 years, I would refuse to take it. I wouldn't want to know. I'd rather be happy now and face whatever comes later. But here's what I know for sure. Whatever the future holds. I know that God will never leave me. That He will never fail me. That He will never forsake me. And that His grace will be sufficient for me. And I can only speak as one person, but to me, that's everything I need. Now, Let's talk about something else now. Let's talk about what might happen when you 
face the prospect of leaving your loved ones. You know, this is, this is frequently, I've heard people say this over the years when they were, when they were facing death. They, said they were afraid about being separated, leaving their family and friends behind. You know, living on this side of eternity, it's hard to imagine being happy unless you're surrounded by people that you love the most. So the idea of, of leaving those loved ones can be a pretty depressing thought. Now, there does seem to be an exception to this rule. And here's the exception. If you live long enough, you can actually reach the point where you have more loved ones living in heaven than you have loved ones living here on earth. That's why very elderly people are often so overjoyed with the thought of physical death. They're looking forward to seeing their loved ones in heaven. I think I've shared this with you already. Before my mother died, the last month of her life, she cried every morning when she woke up because she hadn't died in there in the night and been able to see Jesus and my dad and her parents and her, par her mother and father-in-law, all the people that I love who are living in heaven. Folks, here's the thing. If you know that your loved ones are going to be with you eventually in heaven, if you know that they are saved, man, that changes everything. But as far as being happy in heaven, you don't have to worry about that. Listen, turn with me. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love Him. Now, to get a little more specific about this, listen to what Jesus says in John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me that you also may be where I am. Now think about what, this, what Jesus is just saying here. Jesus has been hard at work preparing a place for you, a home for you. Now it's kind of silly to think that when Jesus has spent all this time working on this project, that we're going to find ourselves miserable being a part of it. That doesn't make any sense. Heaven is not going to be dreary. It's going to be better than anything we can imagine here on earth. The place Jesus is preparing for you is going to be filled with greater love, greater joy, greater intimacy than anything that you can imagine here on earth. And yes, there's one other thing it will be. It'll be more fun. You know? Sometimes we forget to think about the fact that heaven's going to be fun, but the Bible tells six yes very strongly that we're going to have fun. We're going to have pleasure in heaven. All I can say is this, it's not an exaggeration to say that heaven is going to blow your mind. Another thing you need to remember, when you leave your friends, that will only be a temporary situation. Now, you, it may seem like a long time by human standards when you think about a loved one who's gone ahead of you. But if you're in heaven and you're the one who went ahead, you're not going to be thinking that way. See, in heaven, human standards like time no longer exist. Jesus is preparing a place for us in eternity. And eternity means that time ceases to have meaning. It no longer exists. In eternity, you'll have the same perspective on time that God has now. Listen to what the Bible says in 2 Peter 3.8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. Now here's one of those places where the Bible is, where you have to remember what you're dealing with. This passage of Scripture is actually a paraphrase of a psalm. In other words, what we've got here is a poetic way of describing an eternal truth. 
The Bible isn't saying that to God, a 24-hour day is the same thing as a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a 24-hour day. That's not what it's saying here. Rather, this is, this is taking, talking about the fact that in eternity, time is irrelevant because it no longer exists. That's what awaits you and me in heaven. No matter how long it will be between the time of your physical death and the moment that you are reunited with your loved ones, it will seem like a very, very short time. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. Revelation 6, verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the full number of their fellow servants, their brothers and sisters, were killed just as they had been. Do you notice what God tells the martyrs? These are people who died for their faith. They're, out, they're calling out to God for justice. And those cries for justice will not be fully completed until Jesus comes again. And yet they were told, now, now wait a little longer. From a human perspective, think about, you know, I think about it sometimes like this. From a human perspective, 2,000 years have, have passed since Jesus ascended into heaven, right? All right, by God's standards, that's two days, right? Well, for that matter, it can be how many ever days there are in, in, in 2,000 years. The point is, from our perspective in heaven, it's going to be just a moment before we'll be reunited with our loved ones. And they will be reunited with us. Because the Bible also tells us that there is going to be a glorious homecoming when we're in heaven. When Stephanie left for her senior the, the semester, she spent abroad at, uh, at, in South Africa during her senior year at Furman. She was a long way from home. I got out the maps and determined that she would have been 500 miles closer to Charlotte if she had gone to Beijing, China. Now, we communicated by email and a few phone calls by, while she was gone, but it, that was a long time and a long way to be away from my daughter. When she walked into the baggage claims at Charlotte Douglas Airport, I grabbed her and I would not let go. That, this was my little girl. I don't care if she was a grown woman. This was my little girl and she was back home. She was safe. And I was so overjoyed to have her with me once again. You know, I, I'm not exactly sure what our reunions are going to be like in heaven but I have a feeling they're going to be spectacular. Hugs and kisses and laughter and tears of joy as we, as we renew the bonds of love that meant so much to us in this lifetime. Let's turn to John chapter 11. John 11, verses 17 through 26. On His arrival... Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for th four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I, I know he'll rise in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Hear what Jesus is saying here? If you believe that Jesus is the resurrection and the life, you know that if you die in Jesus, when you die in Jesus, there will come a time when you will be with Him and you will be with your loved ones again in heaven. 
That should take care of that fear of leaving your loved ones behind. But some people also have another fear about dying, and that is, I'm afraid about what happens after death. How many of you have ever heard of something called soul sleep? The belief in soul sleep. Some of you are raising your hand. Soul sleep is a belief some Christians have that says that when you die, you, fall, you enter into some kind of sleep. And you remain there in this sort of suspended state of animation until Jesus comes again, and then you will be resurrected to eternal life. Christians who believe in soul sleep sometimes compare it to, be, to general anesthesia. For instance, when I had my jaw reconstruction surgery, I was, I was in surgery for over five hours. But as far as I was concerned, it took like two seconds. I heard the anesthesiologist tell me, good night, Mr. Bass. And then I heard the, night, the nurse saying, wake up, Steve. That's how fast it seemed. Supposedly, this is what soul sleep is going to be like. You'll lapse into soul sleep when you die physically, and then as far as you're concerned, the next thing that you will know happens is when the trumpets sound and Jesus descends and the dead in Christ will rise first. You know, over the last four decades of preaching, I have, I've, I've long since learned that sometimes people misunderstand what I'm saying during a sermon, right? I've been misquoted and sometimes misquoted for the better. But a lot of people don't, don't always understand exactly what I'm going to say. So, so please, please listen carefully to this. If I faced a future that included soul sleep, if that was God's plan for His people, I'd be okay with that. I'd be perfectly fine with that. God would hold me safe in His arms until Jesus comes again. But that's not how it's going to happen. All right? That's not what's going to happen. Think about the conversation Jesus had with the repentant thief while they were hanging on the cross. Luke chapter 23, verses 39 through 43. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. This man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus' promise is as straightforward as a promise can get. Before this day ends, the day on which you are going to die, you will be with me in paradise. There's not going to be any lag time. There's not going to be any period of soul sleep. As soon as your life ends on this present earth, your life in eternity will begin. Just in case you, you still have maybe some doubts about whether or not this is really what's going to happen, uh, let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse uh, 6 and 7, excuse me, 6 and 7. Listen to what it says here. Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we're at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be home with Jesus. There's not going to be a period of time where you're going to be separated from Christ. You will always be with Him, and He will always be with you. Let me share one other passage of Scripture that might, that might hopefully settle this in your mind once and for all. Romans chapter 8, verses 35-39. through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
Here's what will happen to you after you die knowing Jesus is your Savior. You will go to be with Him. If you're a born-again child of God, that's what the future holds for you. You will be with Jesus. And there is nothing to fear in the presence of Jesus. I was reading recently about a man who had been given some de devastating news by his doctors. For almost a year, Jim had been bothered by, with a series of, of health issues. By themselves, they didn't seem to be a whole lot, but, but collectively they left Jim feeling kind of, kind of run down, and so he finally decided he'd go see his doctor. So after a routine physical examination and several additional tests, Jim was shocked when his daughter, doctor came in and told him that he had a rare, incurable form of leukemia and that he had only about five or six months to live. Like most people would, Jim was, was shot in a state of shock and disbelief. He couldn't be dying. He just didn't feel that bad. But Jim was also a believer and a realist. Once he got over his shock, he did what came natural to him. He turned to Jesus for strength and consolation and power. Jim wrote that later that night, he walked out on the deck of his home near outside of Denver, Colorado, and he said, I sat there looking at the river and the mountains I loved so much. Then as twilight came and the stars began to shine, I said to them, I may not see you many more times, but river, I'll still be alive when you've stopped running to the sea. And mountains, I'll be alive when you've sunk down into the plain. And stars, I shall be alive when your lights have been extinguished. You see what all these thoughts meant? This meant that Jim was not afraid of his physical death. He knew that Jesus was his Savior, and he knew that Jesus could be trusted to keep his word. And Jesus said, because I live, you will live also. Okay, let's do this one right now. Uh, I'm going to put it this way. Because I live, Steve will live also. So let's, let's repeat that verse. You say it out loud and you put your name there, okay? Because I live, Steve will live also. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? If you do, you don't have to be afraid of death. Because Jesus is in control. He's always got it in His hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank You for this time we've spent in worship today. Father, we thank You for these words of assurance that You've provided in Your Word. Words that will help us not be afraid of what we might face before we die. Words that remind us that we have no fear in leaving our loved ones who know Jesus behind. Words that remind us that we have no fear of what need to have no fear about what comes after death. So Lord, we live with the victory and help us to live as victorious believers every day of our lives. Father, if there's someone here watching in the sanctuary this morning or watching online who's never asked Jesus to be their Savior, perhaps they want to have this assurance that we've been talking about this morning. They can have it in their life if they ask Jesus to be their Savior. And I pray that they will do so this morning by praying this prayer with me. Dear Jesus, I believe that You are God's one and only Son. Jesus, I believe You died on the cross for me. Thank You, Jesus. Jesus, I believe that You were physically raised to new life three days after Your death on the cross. Jesus, I come to You today and I admit that I'm a sinner. That I've done things that I shouldn't have done that displease You. Please forgive me. I invite You to come into my life and be my forever Savior and Lord. Father, if someone has prayed this prayer this morning, I, if they're here in the sanctuary, I pray they'll come forward when the invitation is offered. If they're watching online, I pray that they'll, they'll send me an email and let me know what's happened in their life. 
Father, there may be others who want to come forward this morning and say, you know, I'd like to join Sunset Road Baptist Church. I'm, I'm currently a part of another church, or, or maybe, you know, my, my church membership has lapsed other, other another place, but I'm ready to come, and I want to be a part of this church family. Father, we'll be so delighted to have them come. Others may need to come to recommit themselves to Jesus, and some may come and want to come and pray at the altar. But Father, this is, this is the time that You will work with each of us. Help us to say, yes, Father. Yes. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.